So prior, prior to this, um, in the judiciary, uh, matters were more or less, okay, so one side has three PhDs and two MDs, in their opinion. The other side has four PhDs and one MD, and the jury was left to decide, based on credentials and not on relevance or reliability of information, um, uh, what the value of the evidence was. Um, so a question for you is, do we need Dalbert standards in the other two branches of government? Should the, should the executive department be forced to meet criteria to make decisions that are, that are science-based? Should the legislative body be forced to meet standards before legislation, statutory decisions be made? Um, where I'm gonna, I'm gonna go is that maybe in the administrative, perhaps, um, but maybe not in legislative. And there's a funny example of a legislative uh, <laughs> decision I'm gonna share with you later. Many of you already know about it. Okay, reminder on scientific method. Um, at several points in this discussion, <clears throat> I will point out that I disagree with our first author in this book. Um, this is the book of record that I'm talking about today, Best Available Science. <clears throat> this is the trajectory that we all f are familiar with from observing phenomenology, um, going through the intellectual struggle that says, you know, why, how, what, where, how, what, what's going on here? And then, in my view, theory and hypothesis happen roughly at the same time. I, um, Alan believes that on observation, you then develop hypothesis, and then you collect data, then you develop a theory, and then ultimately you, can, you have enough knowledge to declare a law. Um, I believe, and I think neuroscience shows, that essentially when you observe that a rock always goes that way, you begin immediately developing a theory, and from the theory, you have a hypotheory, hypothesis that is subordinate to the theory itself, <clears throat> if it always goes that way and there's an attraction that we're going to ultimately call gravity, does it go that way if I drop the rock in the water? Oh, it still does. And I can vary the, the substances until I also have a theory of buoyancy, right? So this is a, just a reminder, and this is the foundation for what we're going to talk about now. That is, there is a level of maturity of scientific thought from left to right, ultimately to a law, if we can get there, and we need to be honest with ourselves, and when we talk to politicians, we ought to be able to say, sir, ma'am, we're only talking about category 2B level of maturity of this particular science. That's not being judgmental. It's being critical, and there is a very important scientific distinction. I begin with um, sources of information in science. Uh, um, I'm on Capitol Hill all the time. I'm in the, the ex executive office of the president frequently and the Supreme Court sometimes and recognize that there are various other people competing for attention. There can be personal opinions, there can be a very gray literature, and I'm going to talk a little bit more extensively about peer review, but I want to give an example of a personal opinion um, and gray literature. In 1897, um, a, a Dr. Goodman, uh, and there's been a rumor that this story happened in Indiana, that it happened in Oklahoma, and that it happened in some other state, and I forgot which one now. But apparently it was Indiana. And the story that I heard was that over a weekend, a, um, a, a, a medical doctor got frustrated in trying to tutor his grandchild uh, in mathematics, then convinced his state representative, who was a representative record, R-E-C-R-O-R-D, last name, that pi should be defined in the law. The mathematical irrational number of pi should be defined as three. Right? Forget the 3.14, <clears throat> and so forth. We'll just legislatively declare that pi is 3. <laughs> That's an example of a personal opinion and a legislative act of science. Right? That happened. What else could happen in law? Well, <laughs> we'll, we'll see in a few minutes. Um, other um, sources of information depend upon what, what we call horizontal review process, that is peer review. Let's review that for just a second. We're very dependent on peer review. The National Science Foundation, National Institutes of Health, the Department of Defense, all organizations that invest in science are, are very dependent, more or less, on, um, on peer review. 
Now, the argument is that peer review began with Hippocrates, that in medicine there was always the notion of sharing evidence and being available with evidence about what works and what doesn't work. But what we know for sure is that peer review uh, increased um, exponentially during World War II because technology was changing from the world of, of chemists in World War I, which was all about mustard gas and so forth, and, and, and fixing nitrogen from the atmosphere as opposed to importing it from south of the equator to make TNT, to a physicist war in World War II. Sonar, radar, atomic bomb, very, very um, innovative in terms of technological change. And so, so there were so many ideas that what would be, become the military industrial complex was very focused on peer review. And part of that process of thinking was that there are more ideas than there is space for in our academic journals, therefore someone's going to have to cull and, and eliminate that which can, should not be published. Same thing happened in terms of grant approvals. We'll get more ideas than we have money for, so someone has to make the choices. Who better than the peers of those who are presenting these, these papers and, and these proposals? Um, I'm going to speed ahead to a paper I just um, published very recently that shows very clearly, I think, that peer review is destined for change. Um, I think the internet is going to be the editors, the people, everything's going to be published, not literally, um, and it will be the general audience that has access to the internet that becomes ultimately the peers who do the reviewing. We'll, we'll see if I'm right. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, another issue that we point out here is the transparency of the peer review process. Um, I have to tell you, I've, I've been lucky enough to be in, on panels at NIH and NSF and, and DOD, ONR for a long time, and transparency is not all that. There is more, uh, there's less transparency and less, um, <clears throat> less accountability in, in study panels than we would like to think, but that's not what today's talk is about. <clears throat> So our nomination of the classification taxons, the taxonomy of, of science, and the ability to use this taxonomy to critically declare where a trajectory is begins with category one. Category one has four components. The first is that which we know. We know that F equals MA at this point, right? That is a done deal. We understand gravity. So. <clears throat> We use F equals MA as an, as an example. Boyle's law, Boyle's law a G, um, solar constant? No, no, back to that. Class 1A is confirmed science, and here the emphasis is on scientific laws and all other information that have been confirmed and accepted. An, an example, and so that what we're trying to point out here is there may not necessarily be theory under category 1A where there is under category one solo. 1A might be speed of light, uh, which in itself is a, is a constant. So three times 10 to the eighth meters per second is an example of category one alpha science. 1B, we're still in category one, that's important to remember that. We're, this is that which we know, it is applied science. And this is all about engineering and science. So stresses and strains and, and, and mensuration measurements and so forth. This, always works for us in engineering, um, and so we, we consider um, this class as 1B. And then finally, 1C, virtually doesn't mean almost, it means through other means, right, not testing directly, but using modeling and simulation or whatever means that we need to, um, to confirm, uh, to test, to prove, um, and to arrive at um, engineering capability. Um, the examples we give here are um, general and, and special relativity as theories from, from Einstein are basically category 1C. It's really hard to go out and do experiments with the planets and heavenly bodies and so forth, but darn it, we think we know what's going on there, but you, because you can't do an experiment, you can't, put, you can't promote this science into category 1 itself. I, I will ask you the question, I'm a biological scientist. Um, so I think that we're at the stage that, that Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection is now category 1C, um, and that's through experimentation, through observation, and so forth. But I hope we come back to that at the end of my talk because I'd, I'd love to know what you think about the theory of natural selection.